Okay. okay. We're ready. As far as you're concerned, Mike, is uh, the music in a television show like another character as far as you're concerned? Yes, uh, very much so. I think that the music has its effect on the story the same way that the style of photography does, the same way that uh, the way that actors are directed, the same way that the way the show is edited. I think, it can, I think you can really help drama with music, and I think you can also heighten any emotion that, um, that the producer and the director and the writer are trying to, to give to the audience. And I think music can definitely do that. Musical composition is a very emotional thing. Now, when you're doing something for a television show, in most cases, you probably haven't seen the television show because it may not even exist. Right. So how do you know what to use or how do you know what to do? Well, in the case of a theme, you would you would have written uh, you would have read a script that's been written for sure, and you would have had mm, a fairly extensive conversation with the producer and and the creator of the show. Um, then you sit down and write your theme. Um, uh, for the weekly score that I do on on the shows that I, that I'm I'm presently doing, I'm the last guy in. I I don't go to work until the picture is finished, in terms of the music within the show each week. That could be very uh, high pressure and in some cases frustrating because you're supposed to have music that's underscore. That's why they call it underscore. Right. So is there a time when you want to kind of come back in a scene and hold up a sign saying, listen closely, that's my work that I spent 10 hours doing? No, because I, I'm in a collaborative medium and the music that I'm writing is supposed to support drama. Uh, if it can stand outside the drama on its own and be a record and be, be viable as a piece of music, great, but its first job is to support drama. So you spent most of your life being a, a supporting dramatist and being a session guitar player. That's a very unsung job. Yes, that's right. That's, I'm, I'm a behind-the-scenes guy that once in a while comes and peeks out uh, from behind the curtain, but I'm a behind-the-scenes guy and happy to be there. What about the first time you ever heard a song that you were a part of on the radio? Was that fun? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's just, you know, you just go... Wow, you know, hey, Mister, that's me up on the jukebox. You know, that's the James Taylor tune. That's that's the feeling. What uh, song was that? Do you remember? Yeah, sure. Uh, I got you, babe, Sonny and Cher, mm. and play guitar on all their hits, really. And uh, it was a it was amazing. It was amazing to be 19 years of age, you know, and and to have to be part of something that was on the radio and famous. And then when it was when it was actually me, you know, writing and the first hit I had as an artist was uh, the theme from the Rockford Files, and that was nuts. I mean, it was crazy because, you see, when you make music, uh, when you make music for television or radio, and you don't go out and play live, you never conceive of a million people, or in the case of TV, thirty million people. You, your mind doesn't even think that way. My TV's in my bedroom, you know, so. The TV's a personal thing with you. Uh, my radio's in my car or, or you know, in, in my home, and it's a personal thing. There's not a jillion other people listening to it and feeling emotional about it. It's just between me and the music. So when Rockford Files became a hit, this one thing comes to mind. I was going to work in Hollywood and live in the valley, in San Fernando Valley, and uh, there's this one place on the Ventura Freeway, or on the Hollywood Freeway, rather, where it's... So it goes down and goes up, and it was bumper to bumper, summer day, hot, and everybody had their windows rolled down. And So I'm driving along, just creeping along, and there's a guy next to me in a convertible, and all of a sudden, Rockford Files comes on the radio, you know, my record, and this guy reaches down and cranks it up, and I had the same radio station on, and so he kind of looked over at me like, yeah, great, huh? And I wanted to say something, you know, I went, yeah, great, <laughs> you know, it was just, you know, what am I going to say, it's me, you know, I mean, it was, doesn't feel like me, it just, you know, it, it's hard to conceive mm -hmm. of, really. How do you know what instrument's going to be the star of the theme or the song? Because you've had piano star, you've had guitar star, you've had uh, synthesizer star, Right. how do you know? Well, y you, everything starts with the story. So if, if you talk to me and you come to me, you're Stephen Cannell and you come to me and say, hey, I got a... I got a show about this guy that's got his, uh, you know, his trailer down on the beach in Malibu, drives a Firebird, and is, you know, kind of southern and sort of southwestern in his attitude. You know, I start, well, what about harmonica? What about this new synth sound? And that, in those in '75, that was a new synth sound, a mini mode. Uh, when Botchko comes to me with L.A. Law, 
you know, the law is, has majesty to it. The law is, is big and it, it has um, sort of honor to it, hopefully, you know, and it's, when it's working right. French horns, you know, it just, it, the melody dictates it, but also the show dictates it. Yeah, there are certain instruments that mean certain things. Right, right. That's, That's exactly true. right. How about casting a session when you're picking the players? Mm -hmm. uh, do you cast them like a director would cast stars? Absolutely. And these days I find myself playing more and more and more myself because the technology's there. And, and I'm not, by any stretch of the imagination, I am no longer do I consider myself even a reasonably good player. I'm a decent player for the things I want to play. In other words, that's me on Hill Street because I knew exactly how I wanted it to sound, and I took four hours to do the piano part. Um, that's me on Law and Order playing guitar because I knew exactly, how, you know, what I was doing and what kind of a sound I wanted. And I had, I took an hour to get the guitar part. You know, um, sometimes it's, you know, it's just better to do it yourself. Lately, I've been doing a lot of things myself. You've had some pretty famous people play on your songs, haven't you? Like Larry Carlton, for one, is a god around here and always has been. He was on Rockford Files, I think. No, What's, no, Hill Street. He was on Magnum. Well, one of those. Uh, he was no, he was on. He was on Hill Street. Hill Street. That's okay. that's Larry. That was him way up in there. That's the right. And uh, on both on Magnum and on uh, Rockford Files was a guy named Danny Ferguson, yeah. who's uh, fairly legendary around L.A. And I, yes, the truth of the matter is. Anybody that stands in front of an orchestra or in front of a rhythm section and waves their hands around and, and writes the music, uh, at least for my money, owes a great deal of the way it sounds to those studio musicians or whatever you, any kind of musician. I've used David Lindley. Uh, I've used a lot of wonderful players. You more than anybody I guess I can think of since you've been doing this since, say, 64, 65 in the L.A. studio system, uh, you've stayed there, I guess, pretty much the whole time. Uh, people say that, you know, that Nashville certainly is a happening situation musically, no question about that. Absolutely. Some people say L.A.'s uh, musical situation is not as healthy as it certainly was in the 60s. Uh, how do you see it? Exactly that way. I would say that um, where we had just massive amounts of sessions going on for television series, for um, records, um, it, it, it's changed. Uh, technology collided with budget crunch and although on the other hand I'm just just getting set to do a, a pilot for Universal with a producer named Dick Wolf who does Law and Order and I'm gonna use 65 guys uh, so nothing stays the same everything's changing all the time and it, it won't always be in, indelible that that LA is is a you know X amount percent more busy than Nashville or anything else like that there's a, a tremendous amount happening in Nashville, and there has been for, for a very, very long time. Uh, I've been coming to Nashville for over 20 years. I've, I've cut a lot here. But Hollywood, the film community, is keeping the music industry alive in Los Angeles, would you say? I would say that Hollywood is keeping the film music industry alive. That's correct. Because there's not much of a rock scene there, is there? No, there, there's not. There's not. It's fragmented, you know. It's in Seattle. It's all over the place because the technology is available to anybody. That's the only reason. There was nothing, you know, it's nothing different in the water in L.A. than there was in Memphis, Tennessee, you know. I mean, uh, there's a heritage in the South uh, for a number of different strains of music, and it's the place where all us kids from the city who wanted to find dusty roads to walk down, and I've learned a tremendous amount by coming here. I mean, over the years, it's been very, very, very profitable to me f from a musical standpoint to go back to my southern roots. You know, my mother is from Fort Smith, Arkansas, and I, you know, I mean, I traveled to the south as a young kid a lot. And it's helped me tremendously. But there's really, the truth of the matter is, aside from heritage and from tradition, there's nothing different about, look, I, I don't know what you think, but... The Rolling Stones are about as funky as I've ever heard it done. And they, these guys are a bunch of guys from England. What are they going to know about this? I mean, they, you know, well, they, I'll tell you what they know about. They searched out Helen Wolf and, and Sun House and, and, and everybody else that was, you know, traditionally funky. Mm -hmm. And they learned it off our records. And they dreamed it just like I did sitting out in L.A. going, God, if I could only learn to play slide like that. 
And so it, 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 it can happen anywhere there's players, anywhere there's, there's that passion for music, it can happen. And now the technology is available to all of us. We're all, it's, the playing field has gotten very level. Did you ever think when you were playing guitar on uh, I Got You Babe or any of those great songs that they did that you'd be the king of the cop show? themes <laughs> when Car 54 was out there and Broderick Crawford was saying 10-4, this is what I'm going to do. No, I, I never did. I never, I, you know, to be honest with you, I, I, I wake up some mornings and I go, this is the weirdest. This is really the weirdest, you know. I started out just wanting to play the blues. That is true. I mean, it's a great job, but it's, you know, it's definitely is a, is a niche. Yeah. You know, oh. you've certainly made your name in doing that niche, but I'm sure you had no way of predicting that. Oh, gosh, no. I mean, how could, you know, how could anybody think that something like that was going to happen to them? And the truth of the matter is I've done a lot of shows that aren't cop shows, but some of the most successful ones have certainly been police shows. One of my favorite themes, and I guess I was looking for it on record at one time, and I don't know that I ever found it, was Bye Bye Black Sheep. No, I never recorded it. You didn't. I no, knew but that. I, that's why I can't find it. Mike. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I, you know that now. There's a typical military type of a theme that I I, oh, I love doing that show because it was so different. You know, such a great chance to write to write that kind of music. And I'm I'm a I'm getting my pilot my private pilot's license. I've always been fascinated with flying and seeing those Corsairs and that that was fun doing that show. Do you ever steal from yourself now that you've done so much? Well, you know, I try not to. I try not to repeat myself. Uh, as far as thievery is concerned, there's 12 of them, and one of them's an octave, okay? okay? And in a major scale, there's only eight of them, and one of them's an octave. So what we're doing is not infinite. It is finite, okay? And after Bach died, it's all, we just took the, we took the big DC and went back to the, that's a musical, as you know, that's a musical term for going back to the start. And... That's what we've done. After Bach died, we just started, we just, okay, well, now let's go back and look at all this stuff. And there's new colors and there's new combinations, certainly, but there's not any, I mean, there's only eight of them in a major scale and only 12 in a chromatic scale, and it's, it is finite for sure. So I, t I tell you what I try not to do. I try not to play tune detective. I try not to sit down and go, oh, well, this is like that, and this is like this, and this is like that. Who cares? Write a piece of music that feels good. Write it, look at a, at a piece of film or read a script and get inspired and write from your heart. You know, what is, you know, what is NYPD Blue going to sound like? I, I don't know. I'd look at, at the script and think about it and talk to, to my friends and, and go, well, it sounds like this to me. And that's what you want to do. It's so amazing when I was uh, on the floor last night listening to the... Uh your newest CD and hearing the drum, you know, all that, saying, boy, that's just so cool how, you know, that really does, it felt like I was listening to the, I was down in a subway hole in New York and the trains are going by the little track, how it would be, that rumble, that, you know, how the earth moves in New York City. And then all of a sudden you can be in a very quiet place looking out a window in New York and seeing that noise, but you don't hear it. Right. And I really got that impression from listening to the music and it, it really is neat doing, I've always thought film music, it was the first album I ever had was Hatari by Henry Mancini, of all the things I could have had albums for. Yeah. And I've always found that to be very fascinating, writing music to uh, supplement or add to whatever film is doing. Well, it's see, very what, exciting. You, what you just said to me is just like uh, Barbara Streisand walking out and getting a standing ovation, because that's exactly what I tried to do. What you just described is exactly what I tried to do. And if you got that from, the, from what I did, then that's a home run. I mean, that's up in the upper deck. Um, that's precisely what I tried to do. Do you ever, uh, have you ever done a concert tour, or done any kind of public performances? What do you do about, that's all private, movie, you know, studio, that kind of thing, but does Mike Post ever really go out in front and do it, doesn't no. want to? Um, doesn't want to. I, I can't, I'm not sure I don't want to, the part of me doesn't want to. Because playing live has such an immediacy to it, and so there's a feel there that, that you can't get in the studio. But it also has its drawbacks in that the music doesn't necessarily ever get perfect. Mm -hmm. And I love getting the music, if, even in its imperfection, perfect, if you know, in its human feel, perfect. Uh, perfect is a bad word. What I mean is I like getting it like I want it, precisely like I want it. And... So I miss that. At the live performance, you miss that. 
because it goes by you so fast. Was that, what did you say, was that in tune? Did I bend up enough or did I, you know, was that in time? You know? But having said that, um, there's nothing, uh, there is one thing that appeals to me and that I guess is loosely considered performing and that's conducting. Um, I feel very confident as a conductor, I feel very strong as a conductor and I, I have done that and I enjoy doing that. Yeah, I could see you doing something with the Phoenix Symphony or something, a night saluting your music. You certainly have enough of it to do now. Right. And uh, as you as the conductor, and let that, all the Larry Carltons and all those kind of people play the guitars, you know, that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's something that I think will, uh, will be possible uh, sometime in the near future. We've got a couple of years to go yet. Yeah. Uh, pressure. Uh, when these people are cutting these deadlines, I know they do on film, and I guess they do on television, too. They absolutely wait to the, you know, they're pushing it to the absolute limit. And you've got a certain amount of time to do a lot of work, and you still have to do copying and all the other things that, that slow down music. And sometimes you have the meter running if the people are in the studio waiting. I know they've had 85 members of orchestra sitting around, you know, doing this, waiting for them to get the next uh, shot or scene over. No, that's never happened to me. To you, but they have some, some film studios yes, and their budgets just go wacky like that. Yeah. Does the pressure, I mean, how do you deal with it? Uh, it's, that's like... Uh, the guy that, you know, has a Chevy truck parked on his foot. And if he was born with the Chevy truck parked on his foot, he go, what pressure? Um, I've been doing television for 20-some years. And in TV, the deal is, before anybody wants to know whether it's any good or not, they want it by 9. Okay, so first of all, get it here by 9. Oh, now, by the way, it's got to be good. So, I don't feel any pressure. I write fast, and that's how you got to do it to survive. And and I like writing fast. And I've I've had some close calls, but I've never missed a deadline in three thousand hours of TV. I've never missed a deadline once. Mm. Yeah, that's the pressure. I mean, just get, I know you got to get it done. But that must be really. It's whoosh. natural to me. Yeah. Honestly, it's natural to me. I never go. Whew, whew, man, just made it. I, I I I've never done that. Now, have you ever scored a film? Um, yes, I have a, a, a number of different small films in one pretty big film. I didn't enjoy the process. Um, number one, in films, they don't have an air date. And number two, it's a director's medium. Number three, all directors think they know more about music than the composers that they've hired. I work for executive producers that have their names on the top of the building, like Stephen Cannell and Stephen Bochco and Dick Wolf. And they write for a living the same way that I do. And there seems to, and, and also I work for my friends. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in this rarefied little ball of cotton where nobody ever slugs me. I, you know, once in a while I get a gentle uh, suggestion to move left or right, but um, cues are never drops, cues are never changed. Uh, and in, in the film business, the director sees his, the film 99% of the time as his jukebox. So the first thing he does is put all his favorite records in it. And the second thing that happens is the tower or the business guys come in and say, well, we've got to make sure we put the records in here that are going to make the best soundtrack. And then the third and last thing is, oh, yeah, what are we going to do for a score? Oh, well, you know, let's tinker around with it. Um, no, thanks. But in their best mode, because there's a lot of that junk going on, yeah. in their best mode, it works with John Williams and Spielberg, who work like a left hand and a right hand. And dear, dear, that's like Bochco and Cannell and myself. That's an old relationship that's been there for years and years and years based on tremendous respect. And um, that work, that's the way I have it every day. And that's the way John and, and Dave Grusin and, and Jerry Goldsmith and a few guys have it most of the time, but not all the time. And I'm not willing really to... Um, I'm not willing to, to put myself up for that kind of craziness. I, I'd rather work for the guys that I'm working for right now in television um, that I respect and that show me a great deal of respect. Let me change tapes real quick. Sure. Bosco's father was the first chair violinist with the New York Phil. He was raised around music. He's very knowledgeable. Stephen Cannell's a flat genius about music. Now, he, he, he speaks Martian like they all do, but but he's a genius. He comes up with the craziest ideas, and they work most 90% of the time. 10% of the time, he screws up. Are we still doing? Oh, we're set. Okay.
right. Staying contemporary, uh, you know, you've obviously done a very good job of it, but you must have to kind of work at it. I mean, it's not something that you naturally do. I know I'm 41 now. I don't necessarily listen to. 41. Uh, oh. I know I'm getting older every hour. Yeah. Get I listen to Nir- quick. <laughs> that I listen to Nirvana and those kind of people just to kind of hear what's going on to stay contemporary. Is there any kind of medicine that you do to stay hip, so to speak? Um, you and I both started out as fans. Okay, we both listened to the radio and. Uh, See, so judging from your age, you probably it was maybe the Beatles or something right around that time. Me, it was Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and so on and so forth, and and Hank Williams and a number of other people, and that same. The difference between you and me, and and somebody that doesn't play or somebody that doesn't create music for a living is a very small difference. I bet you can tell me where you were, by what was playing. Just like everybody else. In other words, music has scored our lives, especially our generation and the generations, that have, the two generations after us or the one generation after us. I'm still a fan. I, I get done working 15 hours writing music and I, and I turn the radio on in the car or I put in a new CD. And it's not hard to stay current. There, I mean, it's not hard to listen to Pearl Jam. It's not hard at all for me to listen to Tracy Lawrence. I mean, I got the radio on. I, you know, I mean, even if I wasn't doing it for a living, even if it wasn't a smart idea as a composer, I want to hear what's next. Is L.A. still the trendsetter? Is there anything next coming out of L.A. that we should know about that you're hearing? No, absolutely not. Any more than any other town. I mean, it used to be like London, you know, was the scene of everything for a while, and we were getting it all, anything they wore, did, whatever it was, we, we stayed on. L.A. for a while, you know, was not being so much the follower of trends as it's always been, but it was setting some, some courses. I, I really think that technology, affordable technology being what it is, we're, we're getting this wonderful spread. Um, Seattle, Birmingham, New Orleans, you know, I, I think there'll be traditions that will continue on. I think that there are business centers, most certainly. We're sitting in one. Uh, New York used to be one. It's not really a music business center as much as Nashville is. Mm-hmm. Uh, L.A. has been one for a very long time. Um, L.A. is becoming a more difficult place to live in, so quality of life, you know, a lot of us that were raised in Los Angeles are looking around going, well, I don't know, could I do it someplace else? In terms of weekly episodic television I can't do it anyplace else. Is there, this is always a tough question for most people who are creators because I'll let you answer it, but do you have a favorite one of your themes, one that you just really special to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the next one. It's kind of like picking your favorite child, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot like that and it's also, it's also, you like different ones for different reasons. Uh, the one I'm working on right now I'm really excited about. And, and that's the way it ought to be. That's true. For my music business class, is there anything you've learned uh, in the, I hope so, in the 30 years that you've been uh, in the music business about the business? Anything that you would uh, tell somebody, get some advice about if they're working in the business? Absolutely. Talent decides if and luck decides when and how big. If you're talented, you will make it. Absolutely, without a doubt. There's too many people looking for you. There's, the public is too hungry for new talent. Uh, talent shines too brightly. Now, that's provided that you have the guts to stick in there and maybe live 15 or 20 years without success. But you will succeed. I want to just say that my goal was and is to make a nice living in the music business as somebody musical, not as a businessman, but as a musician. So I still have a bass, and I still have a number of other instruments, but I keep that bass just in case everything went to over the, you know, over the waterfall, and I figure I could go down to a Holiday Inn someplace and and get a gig, and you know what? That'd be fine. That'd be great. To make a living making music, that's all I ever wanted to do. Now, all the rest of this stuff is sure 
nice and I've cultivated it and, and I, I enjoy it, but it wasn't a goal. It's icing on the cake. But it's all fun, even the session musicians with, you, did you, appre have you been able to appreciate the moment? Oh, of course. Because some people can't appreciate the moment oh. they're in. When you were in there in that recording studio doing something with, say, classical gas or doing uh, any of the rock and roll people you were with, Sonny and Cher, did you ever sit back and just say, man, this is cool? Absolutely. Like daily. I still do. I still do, honestly. And I, I'm not trying to just give you some interview words, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, honestly, I still turn around and go, this is so great. This is so much fun. Now, there's some times that, you know, you get your heart broken, and there's some times you get rejected, and there's some times that, that you get disappointed in one thing. or I don't know a business that isn't that way anyway. But the, the ups in my life have so outweighed the downs, and, and, and just being able to play and be with other people that play and, and create music is, I mean, oh, come on, I should be fingerprinted for this, you know, <laughs> I mean, really. Thank you a lot, Mike. Appreciate Thank you. It. Enjoyed it. Get some uh, cutaways, gentlemen, and we'll be fine. Okay. All the whatever the high tech things we were at the time, all these news scenes, and it worked great. You mm -hmm. know, Rob News Center 13. Yeah. You know, it was it was a perfect. Never, I don't think it was it certainly wasn't made for that. But that no. was, now I heard he. I was reading in the American Gramophone deal mm -hmm. that it was uh, that he re-recorded that for mm -hmm. something for I, them. He I've never, I haven't heard that. Have you, have you heard it? Yeah. What did what he do to it? He just basically did it the same way, just with a little different sound, a little less washy sort of a sound, a little more direct kind of a sound. It wasn't very good, to be honest. Hmm. Yeah, it, was, it didn't have the magic that that had. I was going to say, that's a pretty magical <laughs> cut, and that would be, I wouldn't, couldn't imagine. Mm. Lung cancer. Well, I'm just glad Roger went relatively quick. We, we had it, The last TV appearance he had was a show I was producing here called Hats Off to Many, a mini pearl salute we did with mm -hmm. hundred and something stars, and he came in, and he was going to play for us that night, do something, but he couldn't sing right. So we just had him sit and sing in the choir and just kind of be there. You know, but we didn't know he was dying. Mary. <laughs> God damn it. Of course, she wasn't the original girl. Delma Camacho. Oh, was. really? Do I need to be talking or shut up? During right. this? I need to shut up, excuse me. All right, I remember, where's that first music video, you know, that, that was done for Smothers Brothers? I wish they'd bring that out sometime. Yeah, with all the art. Mm -hmm. You've got to talk now, I've got to shut okay. up. Okay. I'll talk about, what do I talk about? I'll tell you about uh, Roger Miller <laughs> over at my house. <laughs> I had to carry him out of my house last time he was at my house. This was a long, long time ago. Good guy, though. What a great guy. There are legendary stories about him in L.A. Oh, yeah, he was nuts. He was just nuts, but so talented. Mm -hmm. And a sweet guy. He was never never crummy to people. You know, always, even as a complete abuser, he, I never saw him turn mean at all or egomaniac or anything. He was always a nice guy to work with. Just an over-the-shelter. Yeah. Okay, good. That's it for me. I think you got everything.